in the last video we looked at this wonderful old device a vibrating reed frequency meter and we saw how each of the reeds is tuned to a particular frequency and if the input AC power happens to have that frequency the appropriate reed will vibrate showing us the frequency and we even saw that if you put multiple frequencies, multiple different frequencies on the AC power lines, multiple reeds will vibrate at the same time, giving us a very primitive spectrum. What I didn't show you was any indication of what the reeds might look like. And I was looking through my scrap bin and I came across this piece of plastic. And what I realized is it's actually a very good representation of a reed because I can hold the piece of plastic on a 2x4 like this and if I flick the end it will vibrate just like a vibrating reed in the meter does and if I change the length by bringing it in it will vibrate faster and faster and that's really the principle behind the reeds here. You can sort of imagine that the lower frequency reeds are longer, the higher frequency reeds are shorter, and probably by grinding away at the material on the reeds, they can fine tune the frequency of each reed during the manufacturing and calibration process. So that's the vibrating reed frequency meter. But what I wanted to do today was show you how this wonderful device can be mimicked in a computer. And you might think, well, what we're going to do is just mimic each one of these tuned reeds. But in fact, we're going to do something slightly different. And that is we're going to set up a sine wave of whatever frequency we're interested in and see if we can match the incoming signal to that. So first of all, I'll just show you that on a piece of paper and then I've written a little computer program to hopefully give a better feel for how the system works. So imagine that we have a sine wave of some unknown frequency. We of course want to identify the frequency of that wave. We can draw the wave something like this. And we would like to know if this wave is 1 hertz or 2 hertz or 3 hertz, all the way up to some high frequency. And if we were to use audio, maybe 20 kilohertz would be the maximum frequency we're interested in. And the way we're going to do that, and this is the way computers do it, is we set up another wave of our own creation in the computer. And I'm purposely trying to draw it at a different frequency. And we'll call this the reference wave, so we'll call it R for reference of time, because this is the time axis over here. And when we'll call the wave whose frequency we're trying to determine the mystery wave M of T. And in signal processing, we would generally call it the message, but we'll call it the mystery because it's the unknown. And so we want to compare these two waves and we'll pick a particular frequency. Um, let's pretend this wave is at 800 hertz and we'll maybe start off with this wave being 1 kilohertz, 1000 hertz. And what we would like to do is test and see if this wave, whose frequency we know, is the same as the incoming wave, whose frequency we don't know. And it turns out the way to do that is to take the mystery wave, 
m of t and multiply it by the known reference r of t. And if you do that, and there are different frequencies like this, you get a funny looking output. But if they're the same frequency and phase, something special happens. And the best way to look at that is on a computer where we can adjust the frequencies of these two waves and see what the multiplication of them is. So we'll do that right now. Through the magic of computers, I have a live implementation of what I was drawing on paper. And what I'm showing you in red is the reference wave we were talking about. I've set it to one kilohertz. In case you're wondering what one kilohertz is, listen to this. Doesn't that sound great? The mystery wave is shown in blue. It is like the AC input of our frequency meter. I've set it to 800 hertz, but in reality we wouldn't know what its frequency is. And to match the reference wave to the mystery, what we're going to do is multiply them together point by point. So at time t equals 0, we multiply the values together and get t equals 0 of the multiplication, and we do that for every other point in time. One other thing, and that's shown in green here, is the average of the purple mystery wave. And that's going to be our indicator that the reference and the mystery have the same frequency. So let's try adjusting the frequency of the reference wave and see what happens to the multiplication and its average. So watch as I change the frequency, you can see the purple multiplication of the two takes on all sorts of weird shapes, but its average is always zero. Well, that is until we start getting pretty close to the same frequency as the mystery. And when we hit the same frequency, all the points in the reference and mystery line up, everything multiplies together in a positive way and our average goes above zero. And that's the indicator that the reference and the mystery signal in fact are the same frequency and have lined up. And if we were to drop the frequency of the reference, once again the average goes to zero and we get all sorts of weird waveforms that always, well, average to about zero. Now, that's very good, and if we wanted to create a spectrum, what we would do is start at some good frequency. With audio, we might start at about 100 hertz, because that's sort of where voice typically starts, and we could look at the average and say, well, there's no average, so no energy in the 100 hertz spectrum of the mystery signal and we could try that at 101 hertz and 102 hertz and of course it gets pretty boring till again we get close to 800 hertz where it goes up and then it goes back down to zero again and that's all very nice but there is a problem and i'll show you that problem as soon as i get them lined up Imagine that the mystery signal didn't start at the same instant in time as the reference. In other words, we could say it was phase shifted a bit. Look what happens to our average when we phase shift the mystery signal. The average starts going down, and in fact, when we're at 90 degrees out of phase, so these things no longer line up, our average is right at zero. If we continue to go further out of phase, our average 
at about 180 degrees is negative. And then as we continue to further move the phase, well, it goes to zero again and starts moving all the way up. And of course, 360 is the same as zero. So that's where we started. Now that sort of messes things up because if the reference signal were to have started at about the wrong time, well, we would see nothing. But luckily there's a solution to that. And that is we can change the reference wave from a cosine to a sine. And the moment we did that, we suddenly got an average value, in this case a minus value. But as you can see, if we change the phase, now we get zero. When we're at zero degrees, we get a minus value. And as we increase the phase some more, we go back to zero. And then we get a positive value at about 270 degrees. So you could sort of imagine that if we had something in between, we could look at the average from the cosine and the average from the sine, and we could somehow combine them to give us the average if it was in fact in phase, and we might also be able to get the actual phase angle. And we can in fact do that, and we can do that graphically by plotting the average with a sine reference and the average with a cos reference on the y and x axis. So let's do that now. In the computer simulation, you saw how we took the average of this multiplied waveform to give us an indication as to whether the reference wave and the mystery signal matched. And the way we get the average because this is a digital signal, so it's not continuous, as might appear in the printout, is for every sample value, we take its value and we add it up. So if there's a sample here, we take that value and add it to the total that we're going to take our average from. And then we take this value here and then we have a negative value, and I'm going to use a different color. I chose these colors because they were the only two fat pens that I had. And then we'll add this, and we'll add that, and we'll add that. And we will repeat the process. For each sample, we'll add its value into the total that we're going to get the average from. Well, there really isn't much here. Here's some more negative values. And maybe a couple of small positive values and so forth. Now, if you're looking at this, what you might be saying is, well, what he's really doing is getting all the negative areas and all the positive areas in the waveform and adding them together. And in fact, that's exactly what we're doing to get the average. So we actually have a notation in mathematics that says we're going to add together the areas and that notation is the integral, and I'm going to show you that right now. But don't get scared, we're not going to get into any deep math. So we could write down how we get the average of the mystery signal. And we simply take the mystery signal at every point in time, and we multiply it by the cosine of the reference waveform. And the reference waveform is at frequency f. In our case, it was, well, we started with 100 hertz and moved it down to 800. And we, of course, decided we needed to really get the average of all of this. And on further inspection, the average was really more like taking the area 
under this horrendous, complicated, mixed up wave. And of course, if you've done mathematics of any kind, you'll notice we have a notation for doing that. And the notation is the integral notation. And so what this funny squiggle and dt mean is we're going to get the area under this function in the middle here. So if you haven't done math, just forget about this and say all we're saying is we're getting the area under that curve. And I promised you that we could plot this. So we will say this is x. And if we really want to be particular, we could say it's x at a particular frequency, whatever frequency we've set our reference cosine wave at. And because this whole thing messes up, if our mystery waveform is at a 90 degree phase shift to our reference, we have to repeat the whole thing again. But instead of using a cosine, we'll use a sine wave at the same frequency. And we'll call that y of f, simply denoting that we've used a sine wave of this particular frequency kilohertz, 800 hertz, what have you. And now to draw it, it's actually quite simple. We can just draw an xy graph like that, where here's our x, here's our y, and we will plot the values we get for x and y on it. So let's imagine we had a mystery waveform that turned out to be at 45 degrees between the sine and the cosine. So we might get an x value of 1. So here's our x graph and we'll just put in some numbers. And we'll plot a value where x is 1. So that's along here. And we'll also say we got a 1 for y. That's along here. In the real world, these 1s are actually the same distance. They're not in my diagram, but nobody's perfect, I guess. And where they intersect, well, that is in fact where our mystery waveform sits, right here. And its distance from here to here is the amplitude of the mystery waveform, how strong it is. And we can get that simply enough because there is the good old Pythagorean theorem, which says that this length here is equal to the x value squared plus the y value squared and we take the square root of that. So that's the amplitude. Now you might also be wondering if we can get this angle, which I've called theta. And the answer is yes, we can using trigonometry. We know this length, we know this length, and it's a fairly simple matter using tangents to um, get the unknown angle, which in this case, because they're both equal, we know is 45 degrees. So that's the basic idea of how computers can get the energy at a particular frequency or by plugging in a whole bunch of different frequency values can figure out a spectrum. Now there is one other thing I should point out this is the amplitude at a particular frequency. Spectrum, we usually deal with power, and power is generally proportional to the amplitude squared. So if we wanted the power, we wouldn't even need to bother with the square root operation, which would make life even easier. So that's all there is to it. Now, there are 
two follow-up videos. Um, the first follow-up video, number one, is all about the FFT, the Fast Fourier Transform, which does all of this for a gazillion frequencies very quickly and very efficiently because of some tricks people discovered in terms of how to do this calculation in a much easier way rather than laboriously cranking in a gazillion frequency values and a gazillion time points and doing this for every single individual frequency. In fact, you can combine it all together and make it much more efficient. And there are plenty of computer libraries out there that are available that implement the FFT for virtually every programming language. So if you need the spectrum of, let's say, somebody's voice or a musical instrument, it's pretty easy to do. And the next video will be about that um, without worrying about all the complex mathematics. The second follow-up video will be all about the Fourier transform. And all of the mathematics, I'll show you how we basically can take this one step further and it just turns into the Fourier transform. And of course, if you've had any sort of complex math at all in your careers, what you'll probably recognize is this xy plane is in fact the complex plane where this is the real numbers and this is the imaginary numbers in that direction. So we'll look at both of those things in that video. So I hope you found this useful. I will see you again in the next video.